Uh, hello, Harold Pollock. How you doing? Great to see you. Welcome to the Glenn Show. Harold, Harold Pollock is the Helen Ross Professor in the School of Social Service Administration at the University of Chicago uh, and an old, old time friend of mine whom I've known for 30 years plus. And uh, I am, as you know, Glenn Lowry. This is the Glenn Show. I am, let me just say it, I am the Merton Stoltz Professor of the Social Sciences at Brown University. I seldom say that here, but it's true. <laughs> And Harold and I go back a long way. So we're here and uh, often uh, are uh, paired up to have conversations at Blogging Heads. I'm really grateful, Harold. Uh, we have a certain shtick, don't we? I guess we do. I guess we do <laughs> Come at this on. point. I'm the conservative. You're the liberal. We fight about how much we should help people, how big the government should be, what the regulations are, and, and what the ideological currents of our time are. And, of course, the ideological currents of our time today, 2017, uh, less than, uh, what is it, seven months since a major election, eight months at the most. And, and man, uh, we live in some interesting times. So our proposal, let me just introduce it for the day, is that we would talk, oh, because the thing I forgot to say, we're going to talk about politics and literature. And uh, we have some particular pieces in mind that you and I have been reading and discussing. Um, so I really look forward to that. And the thing that I forgot to say is that um, Harold and I have an intellectual friendship, as I mentioned, going back to the 1980s. And one thing that I think characterizes this is that while um, we're both social scientists, uh, I'm an economist, Harold is a policy analyst, health policy and whatnot. Harold actually has a very wide portfolio. I won't dwell on this, but Harold is an expert on uh, finance issues, uh, consumer finance issues. And Harold has done uh, a lot of field work studies in Chicago on uh, violence mitigation and stuff like that. And Harold knows a heck of a lot about epidemiology and a lot of other public health issues. And uh, he's a player. Uh, so he's a, he's a, Harold is, you know, the Helen Ross professor at the University of Chicago. And, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a not half bad economist myself. My green eye shade, the economic theorist published in the journals and stuff like that. But unlike many of our colleagues, if I may say so, and I know this is a long introduction, we actually read outside of the fields of specialization in which we are appointed. And we have a deep appreciation for the humanities, for the, you know, uh, political science and political theory, you know, for history, for literature. And we see connections between our interest in uh, reading uh, important and insightful works of the creative imagination on the one hand and our day to day interest in policy issues on the other. So. Uh, Harold, do you want to add anything to that intro? I'm, I'm trying to tell people what we're doing. Well, I think you you said it well. And then I would say, especially in this moment, when you know whatever one thinks of this election, we're we're living history in a in a powerful way that is a little bit unexpected. You know that that we're we're in an uncertain moment and uh, in America's. Uh, role in the world and what and what many of us think about our political system and the and the imagination and the role modeling of uh, of of people who write about politics in literature or who the memoirists who've written about their experiences going through difficult political times seem newly relevant to me in a way that merits discussion so i'm looking forward to this conversation yeah Indeed, uh, we, you know, it's a very important moment. Now, now let me just ask you a, a kind of procedural question here. You're going to hear some banging in the background because I have some workmen at my house. Can you hear it? A little bit. And, and also, there's a little bit of shaking. You want to sit still? You want to keep Yeah, my elbow still. is on the table. I'm shaking the uh, computer. Yeah. Uh, why don't you let me just step away for a moment and confer with these workmen to see if they can delay whatever they're doing that's causing the noise. If they can't, we can live with it. Okay, I'll do a commercial message while you're away. Good. Don't worry I give about you thing. Harold Pollock. So the last time Glenn stepped away, I made a comment that uh, that you really need to be buying low cost index funds uh, at, and not to play the stock market. And I do stand by that. Uh, if you have uh, a modest income and you're investing, and you're not sure whether to save for your kid's college or your retirement. Uh, one thing you might think about is a Roth IRA and uh, uh and the nice thing about that is that you don't get any current tax benefits, but you will get some benefits down the road, and it's kind of a way to set a strategic reserve if you need one. Uh, hey, Glenn, you're back. Good to see you. Okay, Harold, I don't know what you said, but uh, you said it. <laughs> I did. Uh, and they're going to hold off uh, uh, on the banging stuff. We may hear a little, little something, but it won't be too much. Okay, so we have identified a few works. 
Uh, one of them is the great uh, uh, essay of uh, Vaclav Havel, uh, The Power of the Powerless, that was uh, uh, written, uh, was 1979 or so. Uh, this is right on the cusp of uh, developments in Eastern Europe that presage what ends up being the collapse of a totalitarian regime that crossed national borders and uh, controlled the lives of uh, many hundreds of millions of people. And Havel was an intellectual combatant of his time. He and other dissidents in Eastern Europe who were seeking ways to expose and undermine the, the legitimacy and the credibility of the, of the ruling ideology. Uh, in this essay, The Power of the Powerless is a kind of uh, profound uh, uh, diagnosis of the insidious character of the domination, the ideological and political domination, which was a feature of the, of the uh, communist uh, uh, totalitarian world uh, in his time. This is Vaclav Havel, The Power of the Powerless. You and I have both read this essay many years ago and read it again recently. We want to discuss it. I'm actually in a moment going to uh, start us off with a, a quotation from the essay. I think the words matter. I think the craft of the language matters. It's important to set the stage in that way, I think. I'm glad you agree. Uh, we've also uh, both encountered recently the writings of one Arthur Miller. This would be the great American playwright of mid-20th century, um, author of Death of a Salesman, Willie Loman, uh, about which you have this wonderful little essay here, and I hope that everyone would be able to see it. They should go to your website. I'm sure they can find it there. Um, and also author of a play which I recently read, The Crucible, uh, which is a sort of fictional, historical fictional account of the Salem Witch Trial, 1692, and uh, the aftermath of that and, and the, the genesis of it and the character of it and whatnot, also in some ways relevant to our time. You and I both think so, though for perhaps for slightly different reasons. Yeah. Again, I, I give you a chance if you want to interject something. Well, let me inject two things. Uh, one is I think both of those essays, and we'll get into it, are about how to live with integrity in moments that challenge that, where politics challenges that. And Havel being the great – he was one of the leaders of the Charter 77 movement in Czechoslovakia, which was really about the post-totalitarian Czechoslovakia uh, in which you had this fundamentally delegitimated – uh, government that people were living under in a way that we'll talk about. Yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, and of course, uh, the crucible is a great parable of the McCarthy era. Indeed. And, uh, as, as we, as we can uh, talk about, but one of the things about this article, one of the things about today's conversation that strikes me is, yeah, I grew up as a cold war liberal and, uh, you know, I grew up in a town with a lot of refugees from the Soviet union and also Holocaust survivors. And uh, and it's uh, it's funny because on Twitter, I'm often called a communist or whatever, just because, you know, that's what that's the level of discourse. And 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 it's so not I actually grew up when I was a teenager. I knew about Václav Havel and I knew about Lech Walesa and solidarity. And I was very moved by the struggle uh, against uh, uh you know, you know, against uh, uh, against the communist system, against the Soviet Union. And I remember when I was maybe 17, I read an account of Lech Wałęsa, who was he was in a factory, and the Polish government they, they there was a sit-in in the factory, and the solidarity workers were there, and and the secret police of the the Polish secret police had brought a, a goons to the factory, and what they were and they were outside and they were banging with their trenches on the windows of the factory to intimidate the workers. Huh. And, and, and Voessa said, at one point Voessa looked at all the people and he said, I want you to look at the person to your right and to the person that's your left. And if somebody is frightened, you might need to buck up that person and just put your hand, you know, just, just, uh, just put your hand on that person's shoulder, show them that you're, that's what solidarity is. Wow. That's pretty profound. Harold. I like the story. I, ne I have and, not heard it. And there were, you know, Israel Emiot was a person I knew from my Jewish community center who walked with a cane. He had been a survivor of a labor camp. And there were very powerful, 
memories. I just find it so ironic that we are now, I'm once again a Cold War liberal, uh, you know, in a totally different context where Russian, Russian nationalism is once again uh, in American politics in a new way. So I'll, I'll, let, you, uh, I'll let you pick up uh, with uh, Václav Havel, and then we've got a lot to talk about. Okay, Václav, you're saying, and I've been saying Václav for so many decades. <laughs> But Václav, is that is that how you'd say it if you spoke uh, uh, the Czech language? You know, I I could speak with great self confidence now, but I would be uh, <laughs> uh, I would not be speaking in the spirit of integrity that we're trying to maintain. All right, let's uh, carry on in that fine spirit. Uh, so, Blogging Heads audience, I'm about to engage in a somewhat unusual thing here at Blogging Heads, which is I'm going to read a text. Again, I think the craft of the words are important. There are ideas, and then we're going to discuss it, Harold and I. So. It may take a couple of three minutes, but uh, you guys bear with me. Uh, you men and women of the Blogging Heads audience, bear with me. Okay, so this is Václav Havel, and this is from early in his essay, The Power of the Powerless. And this is the fabled parable of the green grocer, uh, which has uh, come to much critical attention of people who are familiar with this essay, because it's, it's, it's really very powerful and insightful, and I'm just going to read it. Okay, so here we go. Uh, the manager of a fruit and vegetable shop places in his window among the onions and carrots the slogan, workers of the world unite. Why does he do it? What is he trying to communicate to the world? Is he genuinely enthusiastic about the idea of unity among the workers of the world? Is his enthusiasm so great that he feels an irrepressible impulse to acquaint the public with his ideals? Has he really given more than a moment's thought? to how such a unification might occur and what it would mean? I think I, it can safely be assumed that the overwhelming majority of shopkeepers never think about the slogans they put in their windows, nor do they use them to express their real opinions. That poster was delivered to our greengrocer from the Enterprise headquarters, along with the onions and carrots. He put them all into the window simply because it has been done that way for years because everyone does it and because that is the way it has to be. If he were to refuse, there could be trouble. He could be reproached for not having the proper decoration in his window. Someone might even accuse him of disloyalty. He does it because these things must be done if one is to get along in life. It is one of the thousands of details that guarantee him a relatively tranquil life in harmony with society, quote as they say. Obviously, the green grocer is indifferent to the semantic content of the slogan on exhibit. Exit. He does not put the slogan in his window from any personal desire to acquaint the public with the ideal it expresses. This, of course, does not mean that his action has no motive or significance at all, or that the slogan communicates nothing to anyone. The slogan is really a sign, and as such, it contains a subliminal but very definitive message. Verbally, it might be expressed this way. I, the green grocer XY, live here and I know what I must do. I behave in the manner expected of me. I can be depended upon and am beyond reproach. I am obedient and therefore I have the right to be left in peace. Close quote. This message, of course, has an addressee. It is directed above to the green grocer superior, and at the same time, it is a shield that protects the green grocer from potential informers. The slogan's real meaning, therefore, is rooted firmly in the green grocer's existence. It reflects his vital interests. But what are those vital interests? Permit me to go on just a moment then. Let us take note. If the green grocer had been instructed to display the slogan, quote, I am afraid and therefore unquestionably obedient, he would not be nearly as indifferent to its semantics, even though the statement would reflect the truth. The green grocer would be embarrassed and ashamed to put such an unequivocal statement of his own degradation in the shop window, and quite naturally so, for he is a human being and thus has a sense of his own dignity. To overcome this complication, his expression of loyalty must take the form of a sign which, at least on its textual surface, indicates a level of disinterested conviction it must allow the green grocer to say, what's wrong with the workers of the world uniting? Thus, the sign helps the green grocer to conceal from himself the low foundations of his obedience, at the same time concealing the low foundations of power. It hides them behind the facade of something high, 
And that something is ideology. Again, audience, I'm going to go on just another moment. This is really good. Ideology is a specious way of relating to the world. It offers human beings the illusion of an identity, of dignity, and of morality, while making it easier for them to part with them. As the repository of something suprapersonal and objective, it enables people to deceive their conscience and conceal their true position and their inglorious modus vivendi, both from the world and from themselves. It is a very pragmatic, but at the same time an apparently dignified way of legitimizing what is above, below, and on either side. It is directed toward people and toward God. It is a veil behind which human beings can hide their own fallen existence, in quotes, their trivialization and their adaptation to the status quo. It is an excuse that everyone can use from the greengrocer who conceals his fear of losing his job behind an alleged interest in the unification of the workers of the world to the highest functionary whose interest in staying in power can be cloaked in phrases about service to the working class. The primary excusatory function of ideology, therefore, is to provide people both as victims and pillars of the post-totalitarian system with the illusion that that system is in harmony with the human order and the order of the universe. That is Václav Havel, the power of the powerless. Wow. Okay, uh, Professor so I expect Pollock. We'll continue. I expect we'll continue the dialogue at that level of uh, erudition <laughs> and, and grace. I'd expect there, nothing less from you, Harold. <laughs> you know, there, there's so many things going on in that passage. But there's a, there's a showing-esque aspect to the way that it allows for the veneer uh, over the intimidation that the person is succumbing to. It reminds me, you know, Tom Schoeing has this account of organized crime where he talks about how the local organized crime figures, the way they would extort, extort from merchants is they would rent you a cigarette machine and they would charge you a outlandish rent for that cigarette machine. But you never had to explicitly pay tribute. You were just paying $700 a month for the cigarette machine in the corner that uh, that generated very little profit and that allowed that allowed some element of dignity and plausible deniability which wasn't just for the purposes of uh, legal protection for the syndicate but it was also for the uh, merchant himself uh, and yeah, well, uh, what, what interests me about that is that it's not only an outwardly focused veil so as to make you look good to other people it's a self-delusionary uh, uh, device so as to prevent yourself from coming directly into confrontation and dealing with the fact of your own degradation. That I, I love that. I love this idea that submitting to the um, fictions of the ideology uh, is a device that prevents a person from understanding their own dissipating humanity that's seeping away from them. Uh, and yet they are able to live with themselves because they can cloak it in uh, advancing the cause of the workers of the world, fighting for the revolution. Uh, and yeah. we could substitute uh, uh, similar tropes from our contemporary live, political lives uh, to uh, play that ideological function. So, no, it, yeah. It, 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 it's something that, that, that both diagnoses the way that a an illegitimate regime maintains public obedience and also provides the path of resistance that, you know, one of the things that of course is so the title of course speaks to the way that by, um, sorry, that's okay. That's someone does not want me to, that's the man trying to stop. No, I, I, <laughs> I meant to silence this thing earlier and uh, failed to do so. So I'm doing that right now. But go on. You were saying. I mean, the the power of the powerless is yeah. really the that you know if one of us uh, doesn't put the sign out there, then it's very easy for the regime to to crush that person. And in fact, for the rest of us to look at that person and say, "Wow, he's being weird. He's not putting the sign up." And like, and why you know why is he doing that? He's just creating a problem. Right. Why doesn't he just put the sign up and we can all go about our business? Right. If no one puts up the sign. Now there's power there. 
And we can certainly find many examples. I mean, acquiescence in racial segregation in the South was somewhat similar. You know, it relied on a huge number of people in their daily lives making small acts of conformity that that allowed the system to run in and of itself most of the time. And as long as almost everyone acquiesces in that, including the very, victims, I'm sorry to absolutely. interrupt, it, but it's very important to say, including the victims. Absolutely. And, and, you know, I mean, obviously there's a Havel and Martin Luther King are not totally dissimilar figures in the way that, that, uh, you know, the, in the way that they spoke about this, that by, by collective resistance in these small ways, uh, that, uh, although it's not so small for the first people who do it, that you can make the cost of maintaining this, uh, you know, extremely high. And and uh, okay. and there's an equilibrium. And also the people, you might look at Czechoslovakia in 1975 and say, wow, everybody believes in this ideology because everyone is going along with this. Right. And under the surface, there's a possibility of a totally different equilibrium emerging. Yeah. Preference falsification. Timur Kuran is the guy I think of in that context. But yeah. And... Uh, the equilibrium character, because anybody who deviates is just a sole deviator and they're, they're going to get crushed. Yeah. Uh, so the role of resistance and movements and solidarity, these are important ideas in this context. Um, I wanted, however, uh, and this is not in opposition to what you've been saying, but uh, to complement it, to uh, note that um, whereas... I think in retrospect, we can all say that the post-totalitarian governments of Eastern Europe, dominated as they were by the Soviets, were illegitimate. They were morally illegitimate. Mm -hmm. An effort to uh, undermine their uh, uh, foundation, to knock the, uh, you know, the pedestal from under them, to um, unmask them, uh, demystify these regimes. Uh, they, they sit on top of a superstructure of, of, of uh, belief and, and practice, and once trying to destroy it, the emperor indeed has no clothes. Okay. Uh, that, that is all uh, heroic in our minds in virtue of the illegitimacy of the regimes. Mm -hmm. So now not every such uh, instance of um, this kind of uh, a political, ideological uh, uh, masking and veiling and subterfuge uh, is uh, being proffered in the service of an illegitimate institution. Legitimacy is indeed um, uh, a, a necessary concomitant of the effective performance of Various kinds of social functions. Yeah. So, so resistance in and of itself, and, and even the exposure of the kind of uh, ideological foundation and the kind of mythic and, and uh, if at some level, manipulative foundation of, 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 of institutional legitimacy and so forth, uh, resistance against it, the overthrowing of it, is itself virtuous only to the extent that one has previously made the judgment that the structures that you're that are being supported by these uh, these ideas. I hope I'm not being too abstract. I, I, I know. No, you're 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 not. And let me give you a practical example yeah. of where that's. And I, I think about that a lot when I think about, as you know, I, I regard President Trump as the most morally illegitimate figure we've had in modern American history as president. I when do he was know duly that. elected. Yes. And, and the question of what are our obligations in that context is kind of, it's a complicated question. Uh, the um, uh, well, here's an, Ronald Dworkin has a wonderful essay about civil disobedience where he talks about the efforts in Western Europe to resist the placement of American intermediate range nuclear missiles in uh, in the 1980s. Uh, that was they were they were counter to a Soviet deployment of the SS-20s. Yeah, I remember that. And and Dworkin, this is Dworkin, Ronald Dworkin, he was Ronald of? Dworkin, okay. yes. and and Dworkin is very uh, uh, he is very hesitant about the peace, the various groups demonstrating in Germany and others and other places against the American deployment, where he basically says that this is a non-persuasive form of 
political action, that the political decision, the political system had operated in a democratic way and had reached the decision that these missiles should be deployed and that these groups were attempting to uh, to override uh, what had been essentially from a procedural sense, a legitimate decision and uh, and that he found it very, uh, very questionable. There is a democratic obligation to uh, to accept at some level, even if you oppose it, the you know legitimate decision making, uh, you know, through that process, and that the fact that so much of what they were doing was not really intended to persuade people within the democratic context, but to simply raise the cost extremely, you know, to an extremely high level to override that. And and I I do think that that is, uh, uh, you know, the, it is clear that the fact that I mean, in a sense, Havel Charter seventy seven, all the stuff that Havel did. In a sense, he was taking a claim where he, with the resistance that he was offering, where he was saying, if we offer this, there is no legitimate political process in the country. If we're presenting our viewpoint and the, and the great majority of people in, in Czechoslovakia can either accept it or reject it, as it turns out, they accepted it. Although I, I must say the subsequent history is much more complicated of that country, but uh, uh, so you're right that there is – resistance itself is often staking a claim that you will get democratic legitimacy for what you're doing, uh, but, and it may or may not happen. But, but OK. You mentioned this Dworkin argument in the context of, um, I assume, left uh, – radical left uh, European resistance to the deployment yes. of, of intermediate weapons um, yeah. by the United States under uh, uh, the rubric of NATO uh, to counter uh, similar weapons that the Soviet Union had deployed. Uh, and he says of them, uh, your as I understood you, I don't know the essay, uh, that your resistance is uh, not connected to a kind of politics that I can credit. This is how this is what I took you to be saying. It means to be an obstruction, but the it, it uh, presumes the illegitimacy of something that I take to be legitimate, which is to say the deliberative process by which the various governments involved had come to the decision to undertake this thing. And so yeah. by resisting in the way that you're doing, raising the cost of doing so, throwing a fit because it's happening, um, you arrogate to yourselves a certain uh, presumptive uh, moral superiority that you don't possess. This is what I understood you to say. Did, well, I, did I get that correct? Yeah, I mean, I think the last point, I think what I think there are counter argument would be that that there is a fun, and also that there, that, that that there was no issue of fundamental social justice that would that would merit that. Uh, and, and but I think, by the way, there's a well, there'll, there'll be people, excuse me for interrupting, who will disagree with that, who will say that this is how nuclear wars start and the issue of fundamental justice has to do with the preservation of humanity and that the, yeah. the power that the United States represents and its historical uh, significance vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union is such that uh, huge issues of justice are involved and we side against the United States in this respect. What's interesting, by the way, is the number of issues that potentially could be couched in those terms. There are people who believe that the killing of animals is a fundamental Indeed. breach of social justice and, and and would and believe that if I were to vandalize McDonald's and do other acts like that, uh, you know, or, or hinder the operation of the factory farm system, that I am furthering the case of social justice. And uh, uh, and it is uh you know, abortion is another issue where clearly people who take a pro-life perspective, uh, uh, you would see arguments for uh, for crossing boundaries of legal process, and and it, it is there. I don't think that the, I don't think you can make a clean foundational critique that says that that precisely says, you know, clearly there's some issues like racial segregation uh, where we can where there was clearly it was not democratic. Uh, but there's many issues where it's very, very hard to – people are going to throw their hat over the fence and they'll see if anybody uh, runs to go get it. And in some sense, the justification of democratic theory is almost after the fact did in fact a large group of people when forced to confront the issue say, you know what? These people are – they uh, but, but, they are correct. OK. Let, let's bring this back around to okay. you know the thing, the elephant in the room here, which is Donald J. Trump, uh, president okay. of the United States. Uh, November 8th, 2016, an election. Mm -hmm. uh, not my president, resistance, resistance, resistance. Yeah. And so on. And I'm going to stake out a position and get you to react to it. And my position basically is Trump is legitimate. He's the president of the United States. He was elected by the people. Uh, criticize him. For all means, by, by all means, criticize him. Uh, 
campaign against him, uh, make sure that he doesn't succeed in his legislative initiatives, whatever, whatever. But let's get out of the business of this uh, apocalyptic language about the fact that our institutions have been usurped. Our institutions have not been usurped. I'll just stop this. Uh, this is meant to be provocative, but it, 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 puts the, it puts not too fine a point on it, I hope. Our institutions are not um, being usurped. Uh, uh, the character of the American democratic experiment is not under threat. Uh, indeed, the presumption that it is and the reaction, whether you be in the media, you be within the governing structures of the country, or you be an intellectual sitting on the side pondering all of this, the presumption that, uh, you know, the sky is falling, uh, that the Nazis lurk around the corner, uh, that um, the subversion of the freedom of the press and uh, et cetera, et cetera, is itself a profoundly anti-democratic presumption, motivated by uh, grief. Uh, at a political outcome, uh, not grappling at all with the underlying structural phenomena that generated that outcome. The issue is not what Donald Trump drinks in the morning for breakfast or how many scoops of ice cream he has or what he might tweet. He may well be an incompetent person occupying the office for all I know, although I don't think I know that. Uh, notwithstanding that, notwithstanding that, the people elected this man president. He's the president of the United States. It needs to stop the snarky, uh, uh, knowing, knowing it all, uh, debasement of the office. You say the occupant debases the office. I say your problem is with the people who put that man in that office, not with what he drinks for breakfast in the morning or how many times he tweets. Um, I say preservation of the um, dignity of the office is a paramount uh, imperative uh, in our time. And the fact that the wrong guy won the election is no good excuse uh, for undermining it. Well, let me say a couple of things, and I want to bring it back to Hobble as well. Um, there, um, so one is, I mean, George W. Bush was a bad president. I never regarded George W. Bush as an illegitimate president, even though there was, of course, the whole question about Florida and and uh, the mechanics. He was also a minority president who – and the mechanics of his election raises, raised some real questions. If I, may but, say, if I may say many more questions than are raised by the mechanics of the election that we just had. Uh, well, we'll see how this Russian thing plays out. Uh, although to some extent, I do think the Russian thing has a convenient correlation with other narratives that that we have to be careful about that. Uh, but um, I mean, uh, the, there was a con I'm sorry to interrupt you, but, you know, Florida, man, the count, the recount, the Supreme Court deciding to stop the recount. We don't really know who won that election or actually we do know who won the election. It, yeah, was, the yeah, guy who didn't, was, it was the guy who I didn't serve as president. Now, how can that be not a, a more uh, profound question about legitimacy? Well, than the fact that somebody hacked into somebody's server. Well, I think there's 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 a couple of different issues. I mean, my the reason that I personally believe that President Trump is is morally illegitimate is not because of the Russian thing. It's because he he basically has. Uh, I, I think that that he is he ran litigating some basic issues in the society that that make him that that make his. Uh, he's a he's a right wing authoritarian figure. It's true that we still have our democratic institutions. That he has not made us into an undemocratic country, but that's not his fault. And uh, if he's one of the questions is how he's going to behave. But let me get back to so let me let me link this back to what you I, read. I, I'm sorry, I, I just want to register uh, objection to that. I'll have a chance to explain my objection further. But I want to put on the record that I object to what you just said. I don't think it's correct. But I, I do. I think there's. I agree with one aspect of what you're saying. Uh, although I, I'm going to bring it back to Hobble in a different way. I think it's, it is, I think it actually is imperative to implacably oppose President Trump. And that includes, uh, you know, in, in all the things that you mentioned. Uh, and if he does, uh, and if he carries out certain things that I think would be, you know, like if he tries to deport the DACA kids and various things like this, I, I personally would see civil disobedience as an appropriate response to you, that. You've said that before, Harold, and I disagree with you. I, your your, on, your problem on. is with the voters of the United States of America who duly elect officers to carry out the law. There's nothing right. illegal, immoral about a law about immigration that uh, leads to undocumented people well, being deported. Well, it may be wrong. It may. Uh, anyway, we, we could go let on. Me, let me, um, let, we can pursue that another day. Indeed. 
I think I do think that you're right that respect for the dignity of the office and also respect for what American politics is going to look like when President Trump leaves the scene is important. And I do think that one of the things that worries me greatly is that he's so bad that it legitimates ways of opposing him that are going to become part of, and also the way that he won and the rhetoric that he did, a lot of what he's doing and what his opponents are doing, if they become part of the permanent fabric of American political discourse, uh, we've, we have really done ourselves some damage. And, uh, you know, there, for example, we now have a situation where, so most people within the national security apparatus of the United States do not trust President Trump. And there's reasons why they don't trust him. I happen to agree with a lot of those reasons. But one of the consequences of that is it is clear that uh, a that, that the diplomatic and military and intelligence apparatus of the United States is resisting uh, aspects of the commander in chief. And, and that's showing up in leaking. It's showing up in lots of ways. They are right and, on and every I'm sorry, single- I'm sorry to interrupt you. But you're blaming Trump for this? Well, I am because I think that I, well, I'm, I'm blaming Trump to the extent that that he enthusiastically embraced the help of a hostile foreign power to help himself get elected. Whether you he colluded with that. them is a whole you other don't question. You know that. Well, let's that, you, that, that's let's precisely point. what investigations have been in panel to determine. You don't know that. Excuse I, me. I don't, with respect, I, let me say let me say that I suspect that, okay. and I believe that many people. Men, and I think that is the widely held view. But but the point that I'm making is the precedent of the commander in chief facing this level of resistance, while in some ways I I find it congenial at the moment and in some ways it's it's for important policy. I mean he's he's damaging our standing in the world horribly right now. If you look at for example his You say Yeah. But clearly that is setting a precedent for the way American institutions work. That it's going to that's going to come back. Well, that's and not- that's a horrible thing uh, which should appall us. And the fact he's so bad that he's generating this response. I mean, yeah. imagine imagine saying the same thing with respect to the same internal governmental subversion of the authority of President Barack Obama, because somebody thought that he was so bad uh, that uh, it was justified. I don't no, think I- we'd have any trouble in saying that the people who were doing those leaks and who were uh, subverting the authority of the commander in chief and the chief executive officer of the government were debasing the currency and poisoning the well of American democracy, which is what's happening. I, I that think tr- that, that, Trump that, that, being that is, bad doesn't I, justify that. I would really appreciate it if you would make that argument more complete. You well, find him appalling and therefore? No, I'm saying I'm expressing concern over the fact that because he's appalling, I think it legitimates uh, but it doesn't legitimate it. I'm, I'm maintaining. I'm well, asking you to tell I, me. How I don't it mean legitimate it. in a normative sense. I mean it legitimates it in the sense of it is part of the public discourse that becomes accepted uh, by a wide range of people, and including so it the American to, elites. It ought not to be accepted. I want to push back against it, and I invite you to join me. But but, but here's the problem that I that I have with that too. There's no there's no terrific solution because it's under investigation. Yes. But he's also being profoundly protected by partisan Republicans in the in the Senate and the House. There is, in fact, the ability of the Congress to ex- exercise appropriate checks and balances is not happening in the way that it needs to. And some and what we are seeing to some extent is a belief in the broader American government and in, and the foreign policy establishment that, in fact absent this kind of behavior, that there will not be an appropriate investigation. Can you imagine if there was a Benghazi-like investigation of of everything about President Trump right now in the Congress? It would be, uh, you know, his taxes, everything. The, the guy is transparently a crook, and uh, he's Harold, uh, there's all kinds of things that if he were effectively investigated the way that Hillary Clinton would be right now, uh, you know, clearly uh, I, I would be want us, different. Excuse me for interrupting. I'm interrupting because I want us to get, I want us to get yeah, equal I, time. Transparently a crook. Okay, the president of the United States, duly elected by an electoral college majority, is transparently a crook. Yeah. Uh, were he to be investigated as vigorously as we know investigations can go, uh, his, uh, his crimes would be laid bare. I, I don't mean to put words in your mouth, but this is what I hear you saying. Pretty and, here's, and here's what I want to say in response to that. During the campaign, famously, Trump was asked would he accept the results of the election if he lost, and he equivocated. And 
that was a story for several days, as I recall. And people, perhaps even yourself, thought that he was subverting the institutions of the country in not being willing immediately and readily to affirm that he would accept the results of the election no matter what. Now, uh, of course, investigations are ongoing, and it may yet be revealed that Mr. Trump or people close to him are traitors to our country who openly collaborated, hoping not to be detected with a foreign power to subvert our institutions. And were that to be demonstrated, of course, they should all be held appropriately accountable, including the president himself, were he to be uh, uh, found to have uh, behaved in such a manner. So far as I know, there's no evidence that he has done. You say that it's a common opinion of intelligence and government people that it's so. I say that that's a partisan gloss, okay? There's more than one narrative out there. Well, it's to not, the it's not a partisan, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, by the way, I say it's not a partisan gloss. This is something that Democratic and Republican officials. Okay. Uh, but, Julie, but, 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 I, I wasn't let's, quite let's finished. To, I wasn't quite finished. Oh, oh, go ahead, go ahead. But I may, I may now have forgotten what I was going to say. So you go ahead. Sorry about that. Well, you know, I, I wasn't actually trying to. I was. I was expressing my concern that that many of us would accept against President Trump behavior that that that, oh, that does sorry. challenge I, those. And you're interpreting it. Let me finish making the point. The point was about the the pre-election and the post-election. So what has happened is that there was an election, and what is evident is that in powerful and important forces in American life and culture are not accepting the outcome of that election. The narrative that uh, the campaign was treasonous or near treasonous in its collaboration with a foreign power to subvert our institutions doesn't have any evidence, as far as I can see, not much at all to support it. Most recently, that story in the New York Times about a meeting that Jared Kushner and uh, Paul Manafort and uh, Donald Trump Jr. had with a Russian operative, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I read every word of the 1,500 words in the New York Times about it, kept looking for what the point of the story was and couldn't find it yet. It may yet all be revealed to me but the, the counter narrative is that this is a witch hunt. Uh, there I've gone and said it. We mentioned Arthur Miller in the Crucible. There I've yeah, gone let's and go said to that. it. That, that this is a, a, a hysterical, uh, elaborate, mass uh, uh, kind of panic. Uh, I, I mean the word, you know, literally, I don't, I don't necessarily mean that people are running in the streets, but a, a, a kind of amalgamation of a set of forces that are uh, built on very little at all, except not being willing to accept the outcome of the election. And let me just finally note, and I'll stop. Thank you. It's the voters with whom you have a problem, not Donald J. Trump. And the deepest disrespect shown by a person's uh, regard for the duly elected president of the United States is morally unfit for the office and uh, everything should be done to resist uh, his exercise of that office is to the people who elected him. You, may, well, you need to persuade those people not uh, not cajole them or morally browbeat them. Well, well, part of persuading people and part of defeating that constituency in the American uh, uh, electorate is 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 a certain element of moral browbeating and instruction. The uh, uh, I, I, I'm quite open. I agree that that we need to persuade Americans, uh, but I think part of that is to say, you know what, you fucked up, and you elected the worst president in modern American history. And you elected someone who was an open racist and who challenged President Obama's birth certificate, oh, et cetera, please, et cetera. Please, I just cannot what, let that I cannot what? let that go by the boards. That's hysterical language again with respect, if if respect can be conveyed in this way. An open racist. Yeah. That's my view of Donald Trump. Uh, it's a word that it, it, it's it's a word that does not convey a whole shade of meanings to that that we could unpack in another podcast. But let's go, let's go to Arthur Miller, though. Because I don't think we should argue about Donald Trump for this entire thing. But let, let's go to the crucible. I don't think and, we've been doing that. I, I, and I think we're talking about important points. And, uh, but go on. Let's go to the crucible. What do you want to say about it? So, I mean, there's a couple things about the crucible. By the way, uh, I mean, the McCarthy period is the, uh, uh, you know, yeah, that's the occasion. terrible about that. And, and how does one... Uh, you live with that. I should say that that my mother and my grandfather knew Arthur Miller. Arthur Miller was a fellow traveler. Uh, my grandfather Harry Onsher was a was a fairly prominent communist in New York, and uh, he actually stayed with the Communist Party after the Hungary invasion, which is when a lot of people left. And uh, and Arthur Miller used to come into my grandfather's store. My grandfather ran a wood ran a, like a, a furniture 
woodworking store. And but he was a communist, so he didn't quite know how to charge. So he didn't believe in sort of profit optimization. So he would say, if you want to come in and I'll, I'll, you can take one of my bookcases, but I'll teach you how to make one for free if you want instead. And uh, and Arthur Miller used to come in and he would and they would and he would use the tools. And in fact, my yes. mother knew Marilyn Monroe and knew and knew of these people. And and um, uh, it was uh, and by the way, I should say that these people were very cruelly treated. Not just by Joe, Joe McCarthy expressed actually, uh, uh, you know, the, the sort of right wing populism distrust of uh, then Jewish immigrants with radical views who were clearly the a major epicenter of the communist uh, party and fellow left uh, groups. There was it was all there's so many elements of today that were that in their in their 1950s frame were present then as well. Uh, it is. Uh, and and it was certainly the case that many many people believed that McCarthy was an odious character, but he was useful to them, and they went along with that. And I must say that that is another analogy to the present day. I think in private, I've talked to Republican congressmen who say things about that are more negative about President Trump than anything that I just said. Uh, but they but he they also believe that he is useful to their partisan purposes, and that was Joe McCarthy had an element of that. So Trump I, is Trump is Joe McCarthy now, or I should say Republican support for Trump. Here we have the Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan. Here we have the uh, Majority Leader of the Senate, Mitch McConnell. They attempt to work with the Republican right House to get I don't know what uh, a new health care uh, legislation through the Senate. They want to cut taxes. They want to do what they want to do uh, across the board on various legislative initiatives, and they're likened to uh, people who didn't speak out against Joe McCarthy. Hysteria. I don't think that's hysteria. I think I'm making McCarthyism. A yeah. What in our present political time is anything similar to McCarthyism? If there is any such thing, I would well, say how about, how it emanates Daniel? from the left. I would say it's things like college professors having to hide on their own campuses to keep from being beaten by mobs. That's what I would say. Well. I don't see it coming Here, from the Let me give Trump you an example. What I see coming, and I'll stop and forgive me, are policies with which many Americans disagree. Let them fight out their disagreements and elect people who advance their policies. The sky is not falling. Well, I, I don't think the sky is falling, but I think these are people that need to be resisted. Let me give you an example of what I regard as very similar to McCarthyism. Uh, the Republican National Convention, where they bring up people who are telling story after story of people who are victims of horrible crimes committed by undocumented immigrants. There's 11 million undocumented immigrants. Some of them are horrible people who've committed atrocities. Uh, the fact that statistically that undocumented immigrants are not a threat to public safety and that there's a, many studies that show that, the, you know, that there's no distinctive public safety problem that comes from this group of people is clearly, uh, you know, less, uh, you know, you know, is, is clearly, uh, not part of that. Uh, and this idea to set up a commission that would solicit stories of people victimized by yeah. undocumented – there's a scapegoating of this group of people. Let me respond that, to that, man. That is really – yes. So I, I want to juxtapose the mothers of the movement brought to the Democratic Convention to exemplify the depredations of uh, rogue police officers exercising violence against unarmed black men. Uh, and I want to say that the demagoguery, which I acknowledge is present – in the, tr in the uh, uh, you know, trotting out uh, victims of uh, alien offenders, of course, in a country, 300 million people with tens of millions of people crossing our border, there are going to be such cases. This is demagoguery. Should be seen as being in the same family as the demagoguery, which by trotting out mothers of the movement, I know you may not agree with this, but I just want to finish the thought, um, conveys the idea that there's some generic phenomenon of police officers going around uh, preying upon uh, unarmed black people, uh, when in fact, a counter narrative, which is to say, the police are absolutely instrumental, however imperfect, in securing uh, the, the safety and, and, and bodily integrity of uh, disadvantaged people, including unarmed black men, um, might have been offered. So, so what am I saying? I'm saying uh, everybody is engaged in the business of uh, trying to be a, effective political entrepreneurs by manipulating symbols in front of people. I, I, I would agree with you in one way and disagree with you in another way. I, I think you're right that the mindset, there's a mob mentality that is present in every movement. 
and that the that the plea for solidarity often brings with it both a a request that you exclude that, that you excuse logical and moral oversimplification that you shouldn't and that attempts to create that that often attempts to demonize outsiders in a way that we need to resist. It, it happens that college campuses is, is maybe the only arena in America where the left really has real power. And so we see the left exercising that on college campuses. Uh, and I do think it's troubling. I think political correctness is uh, troubling. By the way, in a way that I'm sure you can appreciate, the fact that I'm so adamantly anti-Trump gives me more of a platform, I think, with my students to, to we, we, we talk about this because, of course, all of my students, I, I'm probably the at the 33rd percentile in my school for most, you know, two thirds of my people are more left than I am probably. Uh, but I'm sufficiently emphatic in a public way that I can say, hey, wait a minute, let's let's at least read the minimum wage study before we think we know what it said. Uh, and uh, okay, uh, let, me, let me say something to you that I want to get your reaction to. Again, yeah. Forgive me for interrupting. Um, so you, we, we were just talking about uh, the Republican National Convention bringing in victims of crime by um, uh, undocumented immigrants. And I was talking about the Democratic National Convention featuring mothers of the movement to underscore how police brutality was a big problem. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I want to hear how you would react to the following more or less provocative statement, which is that because we're talking about HAVO and we're talking about the truth. We, we're talking about how the truth dies under ideology and how people are led like sheep to deny mm -hmm. to themselves the fact that the truth is being denied. So here's the truth. Uh, I want to hear how you reacted. Here's a truth that one might have offered. Trump is wrong. Of course, there are instances of immigrants committing uh, who are not documented committing crimes. That's unavoidable. But what our border policy should be is such that the number of these instances is not reduced to zero. A, it's probably not even feasible to do so. But B, it's not desirable to do so. We should be willing to tolerate a few immigrants who are not documented killing a few Americans. It's inevitable. Let's not impale ourselves on our sword, metaphorically speaking, in reaction to that. Okay? That's one truth that I put mm -hmm. before you. I, I'm intrigued about your reaction. Here's another truth that plays off the other side of this opposition between Republican and Democratic uh, uh, conventions. The protocols that govern the training and the deployment and the actions of police officers place too much risk on civilian populations. They should be changed in such a manner that while the number of cops who end up getting killed might increase statistically, the overall balance between uh, the integrity and the security of citizens on the one hand and the safety of police officers will be better struck. We need more dead cops, in other words. Not more I, dead boys without guns, not more dead mentally ill women with butcher knives in their hands coming out of cop, but more cops who, who forbear under such circumstances exercising force on behalf of their own self-defense in such a manner that inevitably in a country of 300 million people, there will be more get dead cops and that's a price we should be willing to pay. I put forth the idea to you that those two things are truths that can't be spoken under the ideological constraints that uh, we exist in and were they to be spoken might lead to a more honest and, at the end of the day, sustainable uh, resolution of the inevitable trade-offs that are embedded in these policy arenas. Well, I agree there are inevitable trade-offs. I think the police one is much more complicated because, because while a more physically aggressive approach to policing reduces some risks that police have of violence, in the scenarios you described, they also increase the risk to police in other ways. And I think, I think that that police training and equipment and so on, there are other possibilities to deal with de-escalation and so on. But I, I do agree with you. There are circumstances in which we it is appropriate for police to, to not take the path that absolutely maximizes their own personal safety uh, and, that, and that there will be times when that will end tragically. I think as a general policy rule, it's not clear to me that that more police would die if they had higher emphasis on de-escalation and so on. But let, but let me um let me let me make a distinction though. As I said, I agree with you that every group of people is innocent about its own capacity for tyranny and deception and self-deception. And I think people on the left are blind to the ways that we would demand conformity and intellectual mediocrity when we are dominant. In a, as, as we are in some academic campuses. I'll put myself in the left for the moment. I actually don't consider myself a person of the left. I'm a 
boring liberal myself. But uh, uh, I think there's a difference, though, between the, the mothers of the movement case and the immigrant case, because the immigrant case, they are <laughs> picking on isn't tight. They're picking on a discreet, insular <laughs> excuse me, go ahead minority of people who don't even have voting rights. And who are and who face incredible discrimination from the broader society. The mothers of the movement are pushing against the agents of the state, and individual police officers may, in certain circumstances, face a mob or whatever. But police as a whole, they're exercising state power. And in fact, the mothers of the movements were defeated at the polls by the. I mean, Trump won the election, so the, he they they are not attacking a group of people without power in America. And I think that okay. the part that I find particularly problematic is that power, power disparity. Um, I uh, stand uh, augmented in a uh, what I can affirm, and from my own point of view, to be a useful direction by that last comment that you made. Harold, mm -hmm. uh, we've been talking for an hour and eight minutes by my clock, so I think we should terminate uh, part one of our summer reflection on uh, works of the creative imagination that have a deep political resonance. We barely, I think, scratched the surface. You and I are interested not only in uh, Arthur Miller and Václav Havel, but we're interested in other things. So I'd like to suggest a part two with a slightly reduced proportion of our time allocated to arguing about Trump and yes. a slightly increased proportion allocated to our, our, our own erudition. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I second that. And I, I would say, since we are living in a moment, whether, whatever you think about Trump, of great historical significance and contingency, that seeing how people uh, have faced more profound moments of contingency and seeing how they've operated with both uh, sort of integrity and civility. Uh, I mean, one of, the thing, one of the things I think I agree with you on is, you know, to we we need to maintain the civility of american politics and respect for the institutions in in the way that we proceed and i think that we that we, we may not agree about how to do that and what the boundaries are of that but i think we do agree on the importance of that as as what maintains the health of a of a complex democracy uh and i think that our conversation here today uh is a uh, model illustration of how people can civilly engage around these questions, even though they have different points of view. I'm grateful for your friendship, Harold, and for your time Thanks. here at the Glenn Show. So let's sign off for now. Take care, okay? Bye. Bye. Great to see you. Uh, hello, Harold Pollock. This is Glenn Lowry here at the Glenn Show. We just recorded a conversation to which you would like to add something. This is uh, yeah. a new um, uh, experience for me at Blogging Heads, an addendum. Yeah, let the turn the floor. Floor over to you, Harold, and only if I cannot suppress the need to say something will I talk. I'll just let you add your addendum, afterthought on our recent conversation. Uh, I'll take it that's a 60% probability of intercession. <laughs> okay. There. No, I, I realized that I, that I forgot to say one of the, to me, one of the most important parallels or things that I think of when I think of Havel in our current time, which is just the, the role of lying in in public life and the way that that the, the kinds of lies that the president tells and his minions tell that we're not really expected to believe but that are out there that serve a different function like the inaugural crowd lie for example and and i don't actually i think it's i agree with you that we should not equate president trump with sort of you know a leader of an authoritarian regime when i watch people like sean spicer out there they actually remind me quite a bit of the people that I remember from my teenage years who were the spokespeople for the Czech government or whatever. And they would come out and they would say, the Czech people are so grateful for the Soviet uh, intercession for the people of Afghanistan or whatever they would say. And, and they were saying it. They were going through the motions. The people were listening to them. And everyone understood that there was no actual information being conveyed by this, and that you that, that it was a, it's essentially uh, the green grocer uh, act of fealty occurring by a government functionary. And and there is something uh, I I don't think like I, I think President Bush believed that there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. I don't think that he, you know. And and there's a there's a series of things you know you see sort of on Twitter retweeting things that are clearly false, and and uh, they're clearly sort of impulsively stated. And then you see people rushing to defend uh, a statement by the president or one of his uh, Kellyanne Conway, people like that. I see them as very very comparable to the people that Václav Havel would have spoken to in the dying age 
branch of the Czech Republic who were the who were the apparatchiks of that time. And that to me, that's a to me, that's actually the most powerful analogy that I experienced watching this. And uh, and that's and that was the addendum that I wanted to say. And you've done a fantastic job of avoiding interesting. I'm watching your facial expressions. You're working so hard, Glenn. Who's that? That's I, I think you've been you've been doing some self-regulation work that is really that's paying off. Uh, so uh, congratulations. No, you're right. Less is more in this business. I'm discovering that after 10 years of doing blogging heads, less is more. I, I need to talk less and let guests talk more. Another guest whom I don't want to mention, uh, whom I invited recently, was complaining that when I talked over the guest, uh, the guest was unable to be uh, properly heard because of some technical device in Skype that causes the audio on one end to get go down when the audio on the other end starts up. So this, <laughs> this guest statements were only being half heard, this guest observed, in virtue of the fact that I was interrupting. And I said, oh, OK, I see what you're saying here. And, you, you know, so, OK, I stand uh, appropriately uh, reprimanded on that front. And yes, I'm trying very hard, but I do have something to say by way of pushback. Lies and lies. I mean, so, I mean, maybe I have a couple of things to say. Lies and lies. So some of this stuff is characterized as lies. Mm -hmm. uh, how many people attended the inaugural or whatever? Lies. Uh, mm -hmm. If it hadn't been for voter fraud, there wouldn't have been... Uh, the uh, loss of the popular vote, lies. Mm -hmm. uh, I could probably think of other examples if I gave it a moment of thought, but- Don't forget the birth certificate. You, you know them all, okay, okay. The birth certificate. So this is an assault on truth, you say, that it calls the mind of Akhul And what I wanna say is the contestation over narrative, uh, characteristic of American politics in which uh, and, you know, I, I don't want to get into a parsing, okay? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stipulate for the sake of argument that uh, uh, the uh, facts and claims that you made are true, though I imagine that some of them might be disputed around the edges, but lies, things said that are not true. Critical point for you is that they're known not to be true, and so they show a contempt for the truth. It's not only the instrumental damage done by the falsehood disseminated, it's also the uh, uh, open contempt for the very idea that we would be constrained by what we know to be true. And what I want to say in response is, and this is not disconnected from something that I mentioned earlier in, our, in the conversation just recorded, which is we got massive institutions that are uh, the sole purpose of which is to counter, dispel, and fact check the so-called lies, quote unquote. So even if I grant you that they are as mendacious and, and uh, contemptuous of the truth as you uh, characterize them to be, the implication of them for our politics in virtue of the fact that our institutional setting uh, is so buttressed by uh, these uh, countervailing elements are nothing close to what it was that in the post-totalitarian world Vaclav Havel was talking about, the insidious character of these statements known not to be true, but nevertheless uh, uh, announced by people in it's some kind of ritualistic performance in keeping with some kind of ideological thing. Uh, that was That's, that's a, a whole different level. It's a, it's a whole different kind of profound corruption than the instrumental. And then I'll just say one further thing. So that one thing was about the scale, but the other thing is, so what's a lie? What's a lie? Michael Brown was shot with his hands up. Okay, is that a lie? Well, you could say that it was a lie, okay? Um, uh, the the uh, Representations that uh, Secretary Clinton made during the campaign about the management of her information technology. You, I mean, you could say that. So, so uh, Donald J. Trump thinks that the media are dead set against them, and he seeks to undermine their credibility by fighting back. And he tells what you're calling and what I'm accepting for the sake of this discussion to be lies in a contestation with powerful institutions who are trying to define a narrative. I have to tell you, uh, I'm not as profoundly disturbed as you are by the fact that there is a contestation over narrative that's going on, not over, not over facts. I'm a social scientist, okay? I'm not, I'm not indifferent to fact, and I'm not unaware of propaganda. But, but what I'm saying is the effort to, to uh, claim the truth as the moral high ground by one factor in what is a powerful contestation over narrative 
doesn't persuade me. Well, let me respond. I mean, I certainly agree with you that there's a different institutional context when you have the New York Times and the Washington Post and, and the tremendous level of pushback. Obviously, we are we are not Czechoslovakia in 1978. Uh, and we can and we can be grateful for that. Now, I think President Trump, one of the things that disturbs me is that he's trying to encourage his followers to ignore those institutions and to make a test of loyalty to be that you sign on to some BS claim because the mainstream media objects to it. But I do think there's a difference. You know, President Clinton lied about, like, did I have sex with that woman? Let's take something like that. And that what's that? I mean, that's a, that's a straightforward lie in the sense of he said, I mean, now one could part, he obviously parsed it himself, which we won't go into because it's a family program, but uh, yeah, yeah. And, and um, uh, there's instrumental lies, but ones where you just say there's a fact that I'm disputing and I'm actually lying to you about whether that happened. To me, that's a little bit different. Uh, from like to me, the birth certificate thing is is a lie in a different way because it is it is fundamentally not really no one really believes uh, you, you know you, I mean it, it takes it takes five minutes on Google to realize that yes in fact President Obama grew up in Hawaii blah 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 there's no there's no interesting factual dispute there that we don't that we don't understand uh, the purpose of that is not to uh, to, to, to put a fact out that, you know, to make a factual claim out there, which is hard to resolve. It's basically saying, um, it's another way of saying, fuck you to president Obama and his followers. And everyone I think understands what that's about. And, uh, and it, it does seem to me that there's a corruption in that it's, of course, you're right that they're pushing against a set of much stronger institutions in America than it would exist you know, in other places, but they're pushing, they're pushing in a direction that, uh, that is, that is really concerning. And, and it does have a contempt for truth. And, and, and the fact that it is done so recklessly, uh, and almost as a point of pride, it, I have never seen a politician, you know, like you mentioned the Michael Brown example, you know, President Obama's Justice Department, in fact, issued a report which said, actually, we believe that 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 Michael Brown had substantial culpability in what happened, and 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 did actually try to prevent the tr to present the truth, even though it wasn't particularly politically congenial to the uh, uh, you know to President Obama's uh, political perspective to to talk about the actual incident there. I mean, there were, I just, the Justice Department really uh, tried to figure out what happened and reported it in a pretty straight up way, uh, and that report I think is very admirable. Uh, if they had lied. Where they had said nobody knows for sure. Yeah, so so Michael Brown may have had his hands up. Maybe he did. You know, if they had tried to muddy the waters on that, I think that would have been really, really concerning. Uh, well, okay, and, but uh, many people, many people, including responsible press organizations, could be said to have done so. The president yeah, or the government did not do it. I take the point. But yeah. we, we, okay. okay, it's your addendum. So if okay. you have something further to say, you should say it. I have pushed back, but uh, we're now at 11 minutes, so it's going to be harder. I think it's time for me to be quiet. <laughs> uh, there will be much fodder for the next conversation between Harold Pollock and Glenn Lowry, no doubt. Nice to talk to you, my friend. Thanks for letting me stick this in. You bet.